as so this was supposed to go on at 10 and I was totally supposed to get like another hour to sober up <laughs> damn it this is going to be a really interesting Black Ops. Um, not only is this the first Black Ops that I've done exploits, um, this is the first Black Ops where I have been kind of sober. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. There's lots of people here providing booze, let me tell you. <laughs> so, what are we here to do? We got an hour from now. Uh, who am I? Uh, you should know by now. <laughs> what are we here to do? So like last year, you know, I had like one topic, just DNS. It was kind of fun and, you know, left the whole ADD thing alone. Um, yeah, we're back to ADD. It's fun. Uh, we're going to talk about a whole bunch of stuff. We're going to kick MD5. We're going to play with some IP fragments. We are going to mess with intrusion protection systems, which are being really, really abused. Um, we're going to do some DNS poisoning, which again is about the most um, black hat thing I've ever done. Um, and uh, if that didn't help, we are going to send about four billion packets onto the internet. I, I, I have a new toy. <laughs> it has 170 gigabits and permission to use it. I've never actually cackled before. You know, giggled a little, laughed, but... <laughs> We're going to make some pretty pictures. Because I like pretty pictures. You know why I like pretty pictures? Because I can show them to non-geeks and they're like... Holy crap, that is cool. I have no idea what it is, but it is cool. Usually it's just I have no idea what it is. It just ends there. And finally, you know, watch some TV. Um, attacking MD5. Uh, instead of going through all the background, here is the webpage for Lockheed Martin. Fun company. Some of you might have heard of it. Here is the webpage for Boeing. Another fun company. You might have heard of it. Let's see what the uh, hashes of these two pages. Oh, damn it! Uh, MD. Let's see what the hashes of those two pages happen to be. Do do do. Uh, C zero F three A D. C zero F three A D. Hmm. These two web pages have the exact same hash. How could that have happened? Oh. <laughs> I know you like the hash. <laughs> I was wondering how you came up with that shit, man. Holy crap. <laughs> okay, I have to actually turn off my email client this time. I had people like using their Blackberry on me the last time I did this talk, so uh, <laughs> that was really annoying. <laughs> so what is MD5 supposed to do? MD5 is supposed to be basically a data fingerprint. You know, you got one, some file, however big it happens to be. The end result is supposed to come down to a 128-bit signature. And the whole keyword, the magic word is computationally infeasible to find two files with the same hash. Now, we've known since about, what was it, 96, 97? Um, bullshit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, about 2000, you know, 2004... Xiang Yun Wang over in China said, hell yeah, it's bullshit. Here's two files with the same hash. And you know what the response was from a lot of people? Yeah, there you have two hashes, but you could never use that for, you know, actual production data that had any kind of real life meaning. You know, absolutely not. Okay, hype aside, I do actually try to have some technical data. So here's what the story is. MD5, it's pretty simple. You start out with some initial state, and they use like magic numbers, like pi and you know six, seven, eight, nine, one. You know numbers decreasing, whatever. I'm too drunk to go nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I've got a problem. More than that, I got a drink. Uh. Oh, the way this works at my talks, um, I like questions. Ask a good one and uh, you get to drink, and if I can't answer, I have to drink. <laughs> and you know, if I'm not done drinking, <laughs> well, it's a drinking game. <laughs> so MD5 basically is really simple. Start with some state, you loop over all your data, 512 bits at a time, and it shuffles that state. And at the end, you end up with some value, you mix in like the amount of data that you did, some metadata, and you end up with what's called the MD5 hash. Now the idea is, Anything's different in the input data, it should change. A single bit should cause 
half the output bits in the hash to change. Half. It's a big number. What we have here is a visualization of the internals of MD5. You know, we got 64 sub rounds and three rounds, and half of those things are supposed to be flickering. Now, maybe you can't see the flicker. Half of, you see those little dots? There's supposed to be a hell of a lot more. But, you know, when we've got the Chinese girl, so, you know, guess what? Almost none of them are different. You know, first round, second round, by the third round, nothing is different. That's this big advance of this, you know, this new MD5 attack. And um, what's interesting is, once you have two files with the same hash, because it operates 512 bits at a time, once you do end up at an alignment, you can add new stuff. And it's not like you can go back in time, back to earlier in the file and say, hey, wait, it was different earlier in the file. Because you're never supposed to have a collision because that's what the whole point of a hash is. So in mathematical terms, if MD5 of X equals MD5 of Y, MD5 of X plus Q, I better e that's going to equal MD5 of Y plus Q. So that means if we have two files with the same hash, we can append anything we want to it, including web pages. Funny thing about web browsers, who here has written a crappy web page? Thank you. All of you who haven't raised your hands are fucking liars. Web browsers accept everything. That was one of the big advances. You could like put a turd in your fucking web page and it's going to render it something. And it turns out we can even put like these two files that have the same hash. But not only do they render anything, oh, there's a programming environment. We got JavaScript. Speaking of turds. So uh, <laughs> the browsers accept everything and they are programmable. So guess is what we're going to do. By the way, GraphViz is the code to use all this. It's freaking cool. So what we do is we take some file. This is X. This is Y. These are our two files of the same hash. We are going to prepend our file with one of these. And we're going to put some extra crap on. Remember, we can put anything on. It'll have the same hash. Here's the, uh, where'd my mouse go? Here we are. Here's the first web page, Lockheed Martin. Here's the second page, Boeing. And now we have some JavaScript. Now the idea is, is that MD5 is blind because, you know, all this crap is Q. X, Y, all this crap is Q. MD5 is blind, but uh, we can put a program in that isn't. So uh, the program goes back and goes, oh, fuck, I was put on X. Okay, Lockheed. Or, hey, look, I was put on Y. Shows Boeing. And that's your output. And so that, in a nutshell, is how um, Lockheed Martin and Boeing can have the same MD5 hash. That was a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with packets. Okay, I better get back to this shit. So, oh, oh no, I need to have my little segue that's all smooth and elite and whatnot. You know, we're talking about interpretation. Speaking of other things that have to do with fucked up interpretation, god damn, I really should not be doing this drunk. <laughs> you bastards, you moved my talk up. <laughs> all right, yes, you put my talk at the same time it said in the schedule. IP fragmentation, and I quote, fragmentation, an interesting early architectural error that shows how much experimentation was going on while IP was being designed. Quote by Paul Vixi, someone who I truly expected to kick my ass when I first met him, but it turns out he's about as fucked up as I am. Sweet. So what is fragmentation all about? Well, uh, IP packets can be like 65 kilobytes long. Okay. There is no physical network that can send a 65 kilobyte packet. Well, okay, none that's actually used in common usage. So the idea behind IP fragmentation is we can take these ginormous packets and shrink them down into little chunks, fragments. It's fairly straightforward. Why is this a problem? The whole idea with IP is that it's supposed to be stateless. You got a packet, you send it, you move the fuck on. Um, with fragments, hey, you know, you can send fragments and not have to worry about it, but when you receive them, you have to store these things because you get one fragment and later on you might get another and another and maybe you will and maybe you won't. But the point is you got to keep this stuff around in RAM. And that's annoying. Um, not just as annoying, it's about 98. Tim Newsham and Tom Pacek actually showed, look, we can get around like every IDS out there by just doing strange games with our fragmentation. We have overlapping fragments. You know, this fragment says it has the same data as that one. Which one is going to be, you know, 
what is the correct interpretation? The RFCs are just like, fuck if I know. <laughs> and then Frag Router comes out and is just like, no, really, we can kick your ass. Here, watch. <laughs> and so this is like 98, 99. This is old shit, right? Look, IP's been picked clean. There's a reason I moved on to DNS, because like layer three and four are done. So I thought. In the crypto realm, you know, I did all this stuff with OpenSSH. You know, we've been dealing with timing attacks lately. All this crypto is all vulnerable to like how long things take. And I'm thinking about this and I'm going, I wonder if I can apply timing stuff to IP. And it turns out, oh yes. It turns out there's an IP fragment reassembly timer. It turns out that there's only a certain amount of time. Are you pointing at me? Don't do, what are you pointing at me? Oh, now you're the middle finger. What is this shit? <laughs> oh, I'll take this opportunity. So speaking of pointing, there's all these shirts that have me pointing that say scan ran motherfucker. And it's done by the Torcon sluts. And um, <laughs> hey, you got a new title. Would you rather be a goon? Should have had a better t-shirt. <laughs> Torcon is absolutely rad. I've loved that con for years. And you know, they have these shirts for me. So um, speaking of good questions, good questions get a shirt and uh, trashed off your ass. What, I can't be the only one. <laughs> so, okay, look, IP fragment reassembly timer. Basically, these fragments come in and we can't reassemble the packet because we don't have all of them. Eventually, the system gives up, right? Well, how long is it gonna wait before it gives up? Well, it turns out we can fingerprint operating systems with that value. You know, some things will wait 30 seconds, some things will wait two minutes. You know, boom, OS fingerprint, Oh. But that's easy, that's cheap. Let's go ahead and do some more hardcore stuff. All right, what if you have an IDS? An IDS may very well have a different idea of how long a fragment can live before it just gives up on trying to reassemble it. In fact, this is actually true. Linux and FreeBSD have a 30 second timer. Snort's Frag2 timer will wait 60 seconds. Now, if the timer was less, if the IDS was going to keep fragments around for less time, well, hell, you know, we just send fragments too slow for the IDS, but fast enough for the host. But what if it's the other way around? What if the IDS, because it's all hardcore and, you know, it's going to keep things around for as long as it possibly can. What if the IDS keeps fragments around longer? Ooh, we can do some stuff. Well, the problem is it's keeping stuff around longer. How, how are we supposed to make the host see one thing and the IDS see another? Well, our problem is the IDS is keeping fragments around for too long. Our solution, make the IDS drop our fragments. Well, that sounds really easy. How are we gonna do that? Well, um, there are two ways a fragment leaves the uh, reassembly queue. Either A, it times out, or B, it's reassembled against something. Hmm. I like that B. I like the idea that it's just gonna work, but um, not the way it plans to. Watch this. Here's what we're gonna do, right? Look, take our payload, up to 65 kilobytes. We are gonna split it into a whole bunch of fragments. We're gonna take the even numbered fragments, we're gonna make a copy of them, and we're gonna fill those fragments payload with noise, absolute crap. And we're gonna send this absolute crap. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna wait. So we send the crap, and the host has some crap, and the IDS has some crap. But you know what happens after 30 seconds? The host drops the crap. But the IDS, it likes the crap. It keeps it around. It thinks it might be useful. Oh, and indeed, it is useful. Because we go ahead and we send the odd numbered fragments. And the odd numbered fragments go to the host, and the host has nothing. So the host holds on to these odd numbered fragments and says, well, you know, I gotta wait for some stuff in the future. IDS, no. IDS has been holding on to some crap. So the IDS has crappy even and good odd. It reassembles, it's like, what the hell is this? And it drops it on the floor. Uh, but now we send the legitimate even numbered fragments. And uh, the IDS, well, it already dropped all that stuff from before on the floor, so the IDS now has to keep, in its in the cache. Has to keep, in, keep it in its cache. But the host? Host has legitimate even, host has legitimate odd, host reassembles just fine. And then you win.
And now my favorite line, it gets worse. Right now, we're giving the IDS crap. Well, IDSs are meant to look for crap. They might alarm, they might be worried. Is there a way we can, instead of giving it crap, can we make the IDS see something completely different? You know, like the IDS sees a get slash and the host sees a SQL injection attack? <laughs> Here's what we're gonna do. Now, get slash has some headers and a SQL injection attack has some headers and it turns out a fair amount of these headers can be exactly the same. So what we're going to do is we're going to split our stuff into three packets. A common header, good stuff, and you're going to die. And what we do is the first thing we send is you're going to die. No, no, excuse me. No, no. We're actually not. No, no that's later. We're going to send the good stuff first. Good stuff goes first. You know why? Because I want the IDS to see some good stuff. Why? Why don't we you know, give some happy, nice feelings? You know, no problem. I would never attack you. So here's what we're gonna do. So we send the good stuff, and we wait, and we wait long enough so the host goes, "Fuck this good stuff," and it drops it. But the IDS still has it around, and we send the shared common header, and the IDS goes, "I got the header, and it's nice, and I got the good stuff, and it's nice," and so it, you know, assembles, and you know. Says, hey, you know, this guy just asked for a git slash. He's cool. But the host, the host still has, at this point in time, what does the host have? The stuff in its header. And then, you know, the, just the header packet, because it already dropped the good stuff. But it has the header, and now we give it the evil packet. And what happens when the header meets the evil packet? Eh, reassembles a SQL injection exploit. You win. What's up? Hmm, quite a few. So, what about checksums? Um, a prop, there's a problem. Uh, our hosts may actually go ahead and, um, you know, SQL injection should not have the same checksum as get slash, right? I mean, there's 65,000 possibilities. Why would the uh, things match up? Well, it turns out there's this great book. It's called uh, TCP IP Lean by this guy, Jeremy Bentham. It's just hardcore. Like, I ain't saying it's hardcore. Like, the guy debugs Ethernet with an oscilloscope. That kind of hardcore. <laughs> so look, he's got this thing. He's, like, look, he's dealing with hardware that doesn't have enough RAM to have an entire packet in RAM at the same time. Holy crap! <laughs> so he talks about how you do this stuff. He says, you know, well, you know, you, you're, you're checksum. You don't want to have to go and go over all your data and... You know, how do we go ahead and stream out a packet and not have to worry about the checksums? Well, the idea is you put in the wrong checksum. But there's a funny thing about IP checksums, they're crap. <laughs> they are, they really suck. They're just a one's compliment. They're just like adding numbers, right? So there's a really funny thing you can do. At the end of your payload, you can be like, wow, I'm like 32,000 off from what my checksum should be. And so you like, you know, add a little bit of a comment, fix by 32,000. And it works. So you just do that, and now you're, 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 you can have a constant checksum for uh, different, different payloads. We can actually backport this attack to um, all the original mechanisms used by Pacek and Newsham and Song. And it turns out what we can do, and I haven't built this one yet because I really fucked up my arm. Be happy I'm here at all. <laughs> um, but it turns out you could actually send a series of packets such that they on Linux, they assemble into a Linux exploit. And on Windows, they assemble into a Windows exploit. And all because there's a whole bunch of different ways that IP stacks can reorganize data. And you could actually, and I haven't built this yet, and I'm fully honest, you could actually create a sequence of packets such that when they arrive on the host, the particular host being used will reassemble it into a way that is relevant for that host, and you don't even need to get any kind of feedback back. That's kind of cool. Now, hitting the brakes. There's a couple IPS vendors out there who are like, dude, you're full of crap. Because uh, our stuff is going to see you. It's going to see these overlapping fragments. We're going to deal with you, and we're going to shut your session down. Shut my session down. That's not nice. And not only is it not nice, there's not a lot of people who are going to be able to do that. That's really unique. And, huh? Um, uh, some jackasses actually. Complete and utter fucking jackasses. 
<laughs> All right. No, I'm kidding. There. Anyway. <laughs> Look, there's a funny little thing that happens when you block a session. Um, you send a bit of information. I blocked you. I stopped you. I got in your way. I'm telling you I'm here and I'm getting in your way. Um, yo, that's a fingerprint. It turns out that any time an intrusion detection system or a firewall gets in your way, it has actually identified itself because there's about a million different ways that these things can go ahead. You know, do they block invalid checksums? Do they block invalid options? Do they block invalid ICMP types? How about HTTP? How about SQL injection? How about SQL injection of this type? How about invalid DNS packets? How about, you know, like tipping point, oh, you sent a TCP fragment out of order. We're gonna drop you on the floor because we don't like RFCs. They're overrated, you know. <laughs> Or checkpoint, oh, you're using DNSSEC. That's never going to be feasible. Point is, you can go ahead and identify pretty much every firewall and every intrusion production system based on whether in a given session, if you do something it doesn't like, if it kills your session. And it turns out you can find out the precise hop that the IDS and IPS is at by using Mike Schiffman's firewalk method, which is basically you go ahead and you send your nasty stuff one hop before the firewall, and then you send it one hop after. If your session dies one hop after, you know the hop where the firewall lives at. Hi, how you doing? Not that this is anything wildly new. This is a slide from like 2003, and uh, it basically shows you how you detect a PIX firewall. And um, not giving any details, but if anyone ever tells you it's ever impossible to remotely detect a firewall, uh, I, dude, I've been doing it for like two years. So um, I can't say what that's in reference to, but you can always detect a firewall remotely. There's just too many different variations on how the protocol can be broken. So IP shunning. Turns out a bunch of intrusion protection systems, they are, they're acting all hardcore. You mess with them a little too much, they're gonna block your IP entirely because they're like, oh, well, obviously your IP is evil. And um, you know, it's not like anyone ever spoofs IP addresses, lies about who they are. Oh, nobody ever does that. Let me tell you why it's a really bad idea to block traffic that comes from random IP addresses on the internet. Anyone ever type dig? You know, that whole like domain internet groper DNS thing? Here's a couple hosts. You might have heard of them. They're called the root servers. If you can't talk to them, you're fucked. <laughs> So like anyone who's running these IPS is like, hello internet, here is my firewall rule set. Would you like to submit new rules? By any chance, would you like to knock my stuff down? We'll talk after. So it's like, seriously. <laughs> now, you know, I'm you know, showing this stuff. And yeah, you can knock out any of these networks by just like, you know, hi, I'm 128.8.10.90. I'm trying to slammer you. But, oh, I can't stop here. I can't stop here because it is too large scale. And more importantly, I thought it was all cool, but it's been whispered about for years. And, you know, I can't go ahead and take full credit for something people have been talking about. So let's do a little bit more elegant attack. Again, it gets worse. <laughs> I've been investigating DNS poisoning. I've been investigating a lot. Does anyone here know... Um, well, oh, hang on, we'll deal about that later. But I've been investigating DNS poisoning quite a bit. Four billion packets quite a bit. Um, <laughs> is it possible, given these networks that implement automatic network sh shunning, to not just like knock them off the network, but to poison their name servers, to go ahead and redirect traffic from their network arbitrarily? Oh, yeah. Well, there's a funny thing. I showed you before, we will block you from the name servers, and that's nice. But let's do worse. Let's block them from individual name servers. Not the root, but say, hey, large ISP, um, see that big bank all your customers go to? Yeah, we don't want them to do that. And how can you do that? Well, mm -hmm. block the communication between the name server at the ISP and the name server at the bank. And there are two sides you can do the blocking. You can cause the IP at the IP, the, <sighs> ISP, god damn.
Humberdink, I believe I am out. Hey, I drank everything that was there. I think you need a drink. So, there are, you can block at the ISP side, you can block at the bank side. Both ways, oh, God. <laughs> no. So, um, only if I really screw up. Uh, in which case, you're having a shot with me up here. So, um, general theme is to block communication between any two name servers. You can block it either the server or the client side. All right, let's say you spoof malicious traffic from the client network to the server network. So say the big bank no longer likes Podunk ISP. All right, that means Podunk ISP sending out requests and nothing's coming back. All right, you know, let's think about that for a second. We got about, um, you know, assuming a fixed port, we'll talk about that in a second. We got about 65,000 possibilities for what the transaction ID is going to be. The transaction ID, of course, controls whether or not when I spoof a packet, it actually is going to get blindly accepted. Well, kind of funny, is usually it's called a race condition. I would have to get my, um, my fake reply back before the real reply comes back. But you know what happens when the intrusion protection systems are in place? Well, it's a race, but I took a bat and knocked out the other guy's kneecap, so he's not running anymore. <laughs> So I got about an average of 32,000 packets to do, and instead of in about like 100 milliseconds, uh, I can do it like uh, about as long as I freaking want. <laughs> Moral of the story, do not automatically shun IPs. But you know, I can do the other side. I could also spoof malicious traffic from the server network to the client network. So you know, you some podunk ISP and it's like, holy crap, the bank is trying to kill me. <laughs> I paid my loan, man. Well, so there's a little difference here because you'd think if the ISP is no longer talking to the bank, well, you know, the ISP sends out the request and the reply comes back and the reply is blocked. But if the reply, you know, you think, well, when I spoof stuff, well, it also has to be blocked, right? Funny thing about IP, there's no affinity. And by that I mean IP addresses, you know, you can actually return a DNS, when you send out a DNS request, about 15% of the time, some other guy replies, and it works. So that means the legitimate host can't send you back replies, but the entire internet can be spoofing replies back, and they'll all work if their transaction ID is correct. Oops. Again, do not implement automated network shunning. But there are people who like it, and I'll go ahead and I'll say, okay, make sure you can talk to name servers, See if you can make it so your outbound communications override any automatic shunning. And you know, again, do not touch name servers. But seriously, don't do this stuff. There's just 80 million ways that automatic shunning, you're giving, I'm, they're giving you guys access to their firewall table. What is wrong with these people? <laughs> so don't do that. Go to the next slide. But what about complaint emails? Um, you know, funny thing, you know, aren't they going to send complaint emails and negotiate and find out this stuff's going on? Well, funny thing happens when you block someone's name server. You can't send mail to that domain anymore. <laughs> Oops. Um, now, what would I know about complaints? Well, when you send four billion IP packets, people can tend to notice. <laughs> um, I've been working with these guys called Prolexic. And what's up? <sighs> God damn it. <laughs> All right, look. So um, basically, you know, you have these like third party uh, spam filters. You know, they get your mail and you know, they send you the good stuff. You know, these guys do that for IP. <laughs> like, they announce your route and they take all the crap that you guys send and be like, you know, that's a very nice 10 gig UDP flood. I'm going to filter that. So these guys have just ridiculous amounts of extra bandwidth and they gave it to me. <laughs> I've never actually been able to like. I can't send packets faster than this network can route them. I feel like less of a man. <laughs> so I've been working with all sorts of cool people. And, uh, you know, I've been doing all sorts of stuff to be all legitimate. You know, don't do this at home. Your colo will die. <laughs> I tried. It was out in an hour. 
Uh, you will get complaints and um, very scary people will be calling you personally being like, what the hell are you doing? So seriously, I can't emphasize this enough. I'm doing this because there's a little problem with you know, large scale network attackers having better intelligence on the network than like I do. That's not cool. Um, but yeah, don't do this at home. I've set up, you know, reverse lookups and I've set, uh, I'm in Aaron. <laughs> There's Dan Kaminsky security research. How rad is that? <laughs> like abuse mails. Someone has hacked in your box. <laughs> Dude, that's me. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, oh, best email is like, you know, thank you for your information. We will see you in Vegas. Like, oh crap. <laughs> Handcuffs. <laughs> so. What do I want to do? I wanted to go ahead and find, you know, Google's taken out by some DNS poisoning attack, you know, who's actually hit by this thing? So, you know, we scan the world, the entire world, and we find somewhere between, we find actually nine million name servers, but after the scan, only about two and a half million of them would actually talk to me. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> um, I, want, I needed to find, because it, it turns out you had to have a Microsoft server talking to a Windows server. Uh, or no, excuse me, Microsoft server talking, God damn it. Okay, the problem with this plan is like the more I drink, the more mistakes I'll make. Okay, so um, I'm totally kidding that ever clear. <laughs> so look, you have to have Windows servers who are linking to bind date servers. Fairly obscure situation, right? Um, okay, well how do we find that one server is linking to another? And by linking, I mean instead of going out and resolving it itself, it asks its buddy. How do we find these links? And um, the, the way that I ended up using is basically to just ask everyone, hey, you know, hey you, go ahead, you know, what's your name? Your name's Bob. Go ahead and look up bob.madness.net. And madness is a domain I own. If some guy named Charlie walks up to me, okay, I know Bob asked Charlie to look something up. So I know there's a link between those two domains and those name servers. And that's, that's how I did it. What were the end results? Um, well, we got about two and a half million verified name servers, meaning um, they would still talk to me. And uh, of those two and a half million, we used a tool called FPDNS, fingerprint DNS, and we fingerprinted every single one of them. Oh, I got some emails out of that one. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> there are a lot of IDSs who are like, you try to check version. How could you possibly do that? You know, <laughs> your attack is detected by 100%. <laughs> you know it without fail. Like, seriously, people did not like it. But you know what? We're dealing with security, and um, you know, we found about 230,000 hosts that are possibly broken, 13,000 that are definitely broken, and you know what? I'm going to be sending some emails, and we're going to get this problem dealt with. And incidentally, a uh, scan was done in under a day. It's good to be the author of Scan Rand Ice and Packets Fast. Fuck yeah. Oh, oh, that's a, who said that? Who said, oh, hell yeah. Well, maybe not. Hey, someone get him that shirt. Um, <laughs> I'm not replying. So look, kind of uh, reversing the thing. Normally with an exploit, you're like, I've got this box. I wonder what it's vulnerable to. Reverse, um, I wonder if someone fucked this up. Let's ask everyone. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, I wonder, you know, there's these transaction IDs, and if there's a known transaction ID, you can DNS spoof on demand. I wonder, is anyone using the same transaction ID when I make a request to they, you know, when they go out to the outside world? Does anyone use the same thing? Because that'd be really insecure. That'd be dumb. You'd have to be like, you know, one in a hundred thousand to be this dumb. But there's a funny thing that happens when you ask two and a half million people a question. You find the dumb ones. So there's like, uh, so we asked everyone with a fixed, you know, transaction ID. I had the data anyway, and we found about 110 hosts that are dumb. And of these 110 hosts, it's um, major ADS, major vendors ADSL modem. So wow, look at all these networks I can completely own on demand. 
and the name server that I was using to host my own data. <laughs> God damn it. In my defense, it was an old version, but oh yeah. So, oh fuck that. God damn it. Speaking of, God, you fucking assholes, I need to do the drinking game. All right, I'm liking this. I may do all my talk smashed. Hello, sir, I'm drunk. <laughs> I don't know how we never noticed this before. Um, you know how on TCP you can scan for servers? Well, UDP is a little different. There really is no difference between a client and a server. How did we not realize until 2005 that you can scan for client ports as well? Name servers very often have fixed ports that they send all their requests from. They use a single socket. And um, it turns out you can scan for this client socket. You can find out who they're sending requests out to. And I'm like, well, what are these ports? I, I bet there's lots of servers that send out questions from a source port of 53. But you see, that's how I think. The nice thing about having ass loads of data is you can know. Let's look at the data. Oh, look at that. 823,000 times, the source port was 32,768 on an outgoing request. And uh, 195,000 times, it was 32,769. And 54,000 times, 70. Oh, you're telling me on a large portion of the internet infrastructure, I can monitor load levels on remote name servers? Sweet. So, um, yeah, uh, you should be running a name server that actually varies its local port. Other stuff, there's like a 15 minute chunk of DNS poisoning things I can't tell you about, but holy crap, someone's up to some nasty shit. Wow. <laughs> I, and I wasn't even looking for it, it just accidentally came back. Hey, by the way, we're spoofing these guys. You're, you're what? Um, and it turns out there's all these like systems that automatically investigate what the hell you're doing when you are sending 4 billion packets, but when they investigate, they have no idea that the investigation comes back to you. So I've got like traffic from really, really dark networks where it's just like, hi, there's no one within the rest of my class A, but who are you? <laughs> no, 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 who are you? <laughs> So, um, as long as we're sending ass loads of traffic, can we make some pretty pictures? Because, you know, people like that. Um, and so I've actually generated a methodology that goes ahead and um, create maps all internet routes in about a couple hours. It's really, really fast. And, um, you know, rather than just like hype, let's, uh, I'll show you the raw data as it's collected. And uh, before anyone from DEF CON has a heart attack, this scan is happening from the 170 gigabit pipe. So we go ahead, we go into it. <laughs> Boom! Hi internet, how you doing? We're sending out about 20,000 packets a second right now. And um, we're trace routing in this massive, uncontrolled manner. And lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of hosts are talking to us. That's a mess, right? How are we going to filter it? Well, welcome to SQL. Fun little language, lets us organize things. Once we run this stupid little query, you know, show me what, you know, reorder this until it makes sense. Oh, look, <laughs> on the way to 12.10.41.178, here's all of our hops. And here's hop one, hop two, hop three, hop four. What you were seeing before was wildly disordered, and now we have it in order. And how do we define that two things are linked? Well, if um, that number's three and that number's four, then 67, you know, this host is probably connected to this host. Mind you, we're scanning the internet over a range of like two hours, so um, this is actually kind of cool to see it in some degree of order. And um, what does this crap look, well, hang on. Well, what does this look like when we actually get it said and done? <sighs> Finally, I get to show some pretty pictures. Um, I know, I'm well aware. So 
So this data has been around for a while, but uh, being able to zoom in on it is kind of new. And uh, being able to like tilt it down and you know <laughs> raise it up and like fly around. Everyone, you know, Hollywood really wants someone to do this, so fine. Here, I'm flying around the internet. Ain't that rad? Now, the eventual goal, and this will happen sometime in the next couple of months. Yeah, I really broke my arm. Um, <laughs> but the goal is that we can go ahead and we can take live data, and we can go ahead and plot it. So this is all black and white, and as you actually use the net, it goes, you're going over this path, you're going over this path, here's all the constraints and all that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of data I want to be able to you know, collect. It turns out when you do this kind of large mapping, there's a couple things you can do extra. Um, Whenever, you know, we have to scan up to a certain range. If we actually find someone, you know, at the, you know, the farthest away possible, we can go back, fill in the gaps. Um, we can actually go ahead and, you know, put out senders all over the internet and have all the, all the reception, reception happen at the same point. So we can say, here's how the net looks from China. Here's how the net looks from Japan. Here's how the net looks up from Abu Dhabi. And all of it will come back to the same collector. And we can go ahead and we can integrate the data. Um, and the results look pretty cool, but there is, there is a weakness. Yeah, how are we gonna make this useful? And beyond that, I don't wanna have to do this big pre-processing phase. I would like to graph live data. How could I do that? Well, there's these guys. They wrote some code in C++. It makes my nose bleed, but it's really, really cool. It's really, really cool to the level of like, it will handle like two million node networks and be like, huh, sweet, you got more? It's really cool. It's called the Boost Graph Library. It's rad. And not only is it rad, but their developers are like, okay, we're going to support Dan. I'm like, sweet. They're getting like updates, like, here is your code. Here are the answers to the test. Like struggle with this stuff for like four days, send them a mail, here you go. Rad. So, um, what kind of stuff can we do now that we have like, you know, real graph logical stuff? Um, mm, let's see here. Mm, sitcom. This is a router trace on a small network. That's a little dark, isn't it? We'll set the next one to be a little lighter. I know. This is a fairly large scale network. And uh, actually this is a router trace. We're watching traffic. And uh, it's actually animating out in front of us in real time. And we're watching basically nodes that aren't talking to anyone else. Here's a cluster right here that's just one server talking to lots of hosts. Here are servers that have a multi-tier relationship. This is all very early code written in the last week or two. But ooh, it's pretty. <laughs> and. Um, the idea is you can actually like stream random data in. If I had any faith in the networks at these things, I could actually do live TCP dump with all interrelationships shown on that kind of map. And is this useful? Well, I haven't made a discovery on it. I took all my DNS interrelationship data and put it into that graph. And what did we find? Interestingly enough, oh crap, there's a whole bunch of hosts that are all coming back to one that I expected. What I did not expect, and it'll take actually a few seconds for it to show up on this, but you'll just have to believe me. My expectation was that you would have, you know, lots and lots of hosts that actually went to one back end that talked to me. What you actually see is a pretty complex multi-tier relationship. One name server will talk to another name server, will talk to another name server, and will talk to another name server. This was something that I would not have expected. I actually don't know the layouts that create this, but, um, Having seen the data, having seen it visually, I could now build my systems around that assumption. The goal of my eventual, of all of this is that when I do mass internet scale scans, every time I send a packet, I can know the route that packet is going to probably take. 
I can know the routers it's probably going to go over. I can know what the bandwidth implications are. I can look at my pipe as a water hose, as a, not a hose, as a pipe of just high pressure water. And I can go ahead and build taps on that based on what the implications are on the underlying network. So I can say, here's a T1, packets through there can only go at this rate. Here's an OC48, packets on here can only go on this rate. And most interestingly, I can put monitors on every single router that I'm sending traffic through. And the moment those monitors, I call it canaries, you send five or 10 packets a second to each router you expect to go through, as soon as these canaries stop responding, you know you killed them. So I'm gonna start killing canaries, ain't that fun? And now the last thing, I have no idea if I've gone over, but I hope you guys have had fun. Who here was at my talk here last year? Hey, I haven't screwed up yet. So. You're wearing a power glove. How can I resist? Anyone got shot glasses? Can I get some shot glasses up here? What's your name? Patrick. Patrick, this is why I fucking come to DEF CON. Because people will get me really fucked up. Mind you, I've never had Everclear before. Hey, I I am I shying away from this? No, because I'm trashed. I am so fucked. Hey, I am drinking. I know. All right, we're here. You know what we're drinking to? We're drinking to Torcon, probably my favorite small con in the world. It is just the shit. Defcon is rad. Torcon is just. Hikari is awesome. Is Hikari even here? Dude! <laughs> Fucking Hikari. Dude! Hey, wait, wait, wait. Do we have a third shot glass? By any chance? Hikari, get the fuck up here. Here, you're drinking this shit. I'm drinking Everclear. You could drink the fucking Morgans. Just drink. All right. To a great fucking con. You guys all rule. Thank you so much for coming here. Filling, so it's actually working. Holy hell, I didn't think it would actually work. <laughs> All right, I'm putting audio out through the PC interface. This better work, guys. I'm warning you, audio's coming any minute now. Oh, so I had to put on a huge cache on this thing because the Black Hat network was broken beyond all description. It was like wireless from like 20 Mike, feet away. Mike, Mike, Michael Flatley is the Lord of the Dance. Darth Vader is the Lord of the Sith. Okay, Robot Chicken is the best fucking oh, show in the what world. What are we doing here? <laughs> Half Crystal Lake, supposedly haunted by a machete wielding spook named Jason Voorhees. <laughs> we should make like hockey sticks and. Robot Chicken rocks. And that's all about all I have for you fucking guys. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, wow. 
Just fucking come up here. I want people to hear your shit. Seriously, I really want people to come up and ask questions. Can I fucking have your babies? <laughs> Dude, you're a guy. <laughs> Seriously, someone came up with a, some auto shunning question. Come on, come here. All right, what you got, man? Um, can uh, do the IPSs that you're aware of? Are will they auto shun their loopback interface? I had totally not thought of that. That would. B I seem to have nothing to drink. You guys are di are falling down on the job. I bring you here for. <laughs> what you want me to drink? Okay. That's a really interesting question. If the, okay, so here's the idea, and this is fucked. This is really, really impressively fucked up. The idea is, is that you spoof a whole bunch of traffic to some network from the address 127001, which is, of course, the loopback address on a host. Will the idea IPS actually block local host? Because if it does, all sorts of shit's going down. IPS vendors in this room, test, like now, because there's like a thousand people who have the idea of testing it. Hey, you have your hand up. Get the fuck up here. No, no, come up, come up. Seriously, come on up. There's like booze and books and like good shit and like, god damn it. Now, that's just a rebuttal to the, uh, the earlier question is if you've got your router set up right, your edge router 127 shouldn't get in. Yeah. If your edge router is automatic already blocking 127001, then uh, of course, yeah, you're not going to go ahead and get nasty traffic. But um, a lot of people have the attitude, well, I got an IPS. What do I need to put custom firewalls rules in for? The internet will be giving me firewall rules. <laughs> Actually, honestly, probably a lot of IPSs already have blocks against 127 and have blocks against RFC 1918 space. But I'm sure there's one that doesn't because there's some really crappy IPSs out there. What's up? Hang on, hang on, hang on. You have, you're trying to kick my ass, and so, of course, I have to give you the mic. What happens to overlapping segments, Dan? What do you mean, what happens to overlapping segments? What happens, if over, uh, what happens to the segments, uh, the timeout values with the segments are overlapping, Dan? Ah, yes, yes, yes. That's one of the things I pointed out. There are some very good... Okay. There are some relatively good IPSs, because they're all shit, but there are some relatively good IPSs that will notice, hey, look, this, they basically will go ahead and have their timing value for how long a fragment can live, but fragments have a particular IP ID associated with them, and there will be a separate timer, a much longer timer that notes, hey, I may have flushed this from my queue, but this is a fragment on a session from an old, this is an old frag, this is a fragment that could be applied to an old session. In other words, someone could be trying to mess with me. Hmm, why would I try to be messing with anyone? Yeah, yeah okay, so they can bust me. Um, those, those IPSs are really easy to fingerprint. And there is a problem in this industry, there are vulnerabilities in security code itself. I, I don't want to share that, I just want you to take a drink. Really, I am so screwed in TCP IP drinking game. Hey, come up here. Can I have your baby? Well, you definitely are a girl. New comment. <laughs> Later. <laughs> come here. All the fragmenting stuff, does that work if they're filtering fragmented packets? No, it doesn't. But that's a problem because fragments are a legitimate part of the IP spec. They're actually, you know, there's quite a few networks that are tunneled inside of tunnels and they end up with much small, you know, in the multi-tunneling, end up with packets larger than the MTU because there's a lot of packets that will be sent with an MTU of 1500. So fragmentation happens. It's supposed to be limited by TCP's MSS value, but sometimes it really does happen and it does happen entirely legitimately. Now small fragments, and this is very obscure, but small fragments at the beginning of a packet should not happen. And those things are legitimately dropped and that's good. 
Because I've seen networks that do that. They filter out the fragmented packets. What are they missing out on? And what um, is there anything interesting about them? Well, there's an interesting thing. A lot of people say, "Hey, I, you know, I can drop one percent of traffic. No problem. It's just you know one percent." But you get you know this one percent and this one percent and this one percent, and suddenly the internet doesn't work very well anymore. And that happens. And that's ultimately, you know, we have this thing called uh, like congestion collapse when there are too much, there's too much traffic that doesn't back off. There's another kind of collapse. It's firewall collapse when there's too many overlapping rules from people who think, well, our one little variation on the IP spec is okay, and you know we're just going to do it, and you know who cares if we drop one percent of traffic, and then the internet no longer works. And tipping point, I'm talking to you. I, I can't remember the denial of service attack. Is it's either New Dawn or Teardrop, where it's based on uh, fragmented TCP packets. How would that work against a uh, IPS? Um, the fragmented packet. The, 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 oh, are you talking about ping of death? Maybe where you have a packet that that reassembles larger than the maximum IP size. Where the, the TCP packet reassembles and it's broken and it causes the um, it causes various problems. At this point, you know, it's really sad. It's 2005, right? When the hell did Teardrop come out? Wasn't that like 97 or 98? Okay, uh, so so very well known vendor NetScreen actually goes ahead and has like in you know on their thing we blocked this many Teardrop attacks. Dude, it's the 21st century. We aren't worried about that shit anymore. It doesn't work even if it's unblocked. We're not running Windows 95. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, Teardrop, I mean, it's a great brand. Oh, incidentally, you guys know how names are done in the virus industry? It's like, you know, they're all, like, named by the guys who find them. So they just like, you know, we're going to call this attack Teardrop. We're going to call this attack Code Red. Because, you know, hey, you know, they didn't, like, put a big brand copyright on it when they attacked our network. So we're going to name it whatever gets us the most attention possible. And that's why they all have sexy names. Of course, there was a real problem when one of them named in their thing um, Doxpar. Because <laughs> I do Doxpara, network, Doxpara research, and Doxpar caused me all sorts of problems. Especially when the variant happened, Doxpar.a. You... Bastards. <laughs> All right, other questions? What? Hey, uh oh. What do you think of the recent ICMP based attacks? <sighs> There's so much over. So it's really funny. Um, yes, you can kill ICMP sessions if you can figure out the four tuple of source IP, desk IP, source port, desk port. You totally can. But I went on Deja News. And I found a post from 1993 calling this shit old. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> no, I mean, okay. The actual attacks are real but old. To his credit, he's right. They still work and they shouldn't. His stuff about slowing... There's this guy, he has his stuff about slowing down networks. Why am I drinking? I was right. Okay, his stuff... Oh, fuck. Funny guy, he should test the ship. So I went, you know, he has this whole thing, well I can slow down communication of BGP sessions. I can reduce a session down to one packet sent per round trip time. So BGP sessions, I don't know if you guys know, they're about three kilobytes a second. Three kilobytes a second, okay. So um, you reduce the session down to one packet per round trip time. On a session that has somewhere between one millisecond and a tenth of a millisecond latency, Oh no, I can only send a thousand to ten thousand packets a second on my three kilobyte a second link. No! It's ridiculous. Any other questions? Seriously, you don't even have to come up if I can somehow hear you. <laughs> Says the guy from Prolexic. That took some balls. Here, have a book. Prolexic's been rad, by the way. I mean, seriously. They've been giving me shit tons of bandwidth and taking calls from DOD. Rad. Oh, shit, it's George. It's Scanran motherfucker George. You... I hate you. 
So I'm going to the T2 con out in Finland. So who here is from Europe? Dude, Euro guys, I'm coming out to you guys. Most That's the plan. So T2, I didn't intend to give them props because Torcon is the shit. But uh, yeah, T2 should be good. What? I didn't screw up. You drink. Hey, someone get these fuckers drinks. They need to be drunk so they'll shut up. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. Nah, stop. <laughs> All right, do we have anything else? Because I should probably give this shit up to Hacker Jeopardy. Okay, go ahead. You have a good question? No, dude, hang on. I want this guy to ask a question. You said that um, your one of your attacks was based on the difference between IDS timing and host timing. Yeah. Well, in Linux and FreeBSD, isn't it possible, even in extreme situations, just to rebuild the stack? So if you know your vendor in advance, just to match your IDS timings and your host timings? Man gets a book. Man gets both books. That is an excellent point. Those of you who are very smart admins can go ahead, adapt your host to your shit ass IDS and make things align perfectly. Absolutely correct. Fantastic point. Are you advocating we break our, are you advocating we break our host to match our IDS? Hey, I'm advocating we adapt our host to agree with our IDS's fucked up view of the universe. Thank you very much. Absolutely. What's up? <laughs> and I think, unless there's any more questions, I think I am done here. You guys are fantastic. I love you guys. As a note... I talk at Black Hat as practice for you guys. You guys are awesome. I cannot even say thank you so much for all. And oh, there's one last thing that is really important that you all know. I have an insane network pipe and I'm taking proposals for how to use it. If you have an idea for what will help secure the internet, I will take the shit of spreading it everywhere. Talk to me. Don't do it yourself. No, not porn. <laughs> you sick fuck. Especially for the kind of porn you want. <laughs> All right, I'm off to the drinking game where I will puke my guts out. Thank you.